Hi, Professor Gassini here. In this component of the lecture, we're going to be speaking about text normalization. Text normalization is just a three-step process that we perform prior to any kind of formal statistical analysis of our natural language. Those three steps are tokenization, which is segmenting our text usually into words. The second step is normalizing word format. So that's taking symbols that might be represented differently and you know, making sure they're represented in similar ways prior to the analysis. And then the third is splitting our text into sentences or grouping the tokens by sentence. So let's look at an example of each of these. Let's assume that we have following text. The US is a big nation. Americans love the US a lot. They like to drive their cars around the country. They measure speed in MPH, not KM. Well, if we were to perform a tokenization operation on this, we'd be transforming the text from this representation to this representation. And what you can see here is we've just taken each of the words that was uh, within that text block and we've broken them out into their individual words in a comma-separated list. Normalization would be the process of understanding that US, which is the second token that you see there in red, is actually equivalent to U.S dot a dot and making sure that those two are represented similarly in our data. And then the process of sentence segmentation would be identifying that what are the set of periods within this text data, which of those periods actually refer to the end of sentences and which ones refer to, for instance, uh, signals that we're abbreviating like the M dot P dot uh, symbols do and then breaking the sentences up on the basis of the actual terminating characters so that we get a nice square matrix that represents each of the sentences and each of the words in order for each of those sentences. So this is all text normalization refers to. So now that you have a basic idea of how text normalization approaches, let's dive into greater detail into each of those three components, starting with word tokenization. Tokenization is just the task of segmenting your text into a set of words. The simplest way you can do that is with a white space split. So a typical approach here for white space splitting is to take a sentence like the one we see on the right hand side. So comma, we meet again, identifying where all the punctuation and special characters are. There's a comma and an exclamation mark in this case, replacing those with white space and then splitting everywhere where we see a white space character. So the pros of this approach are that it's very simple to implement um, and it's actually effective for a surprisingly large number of basic NLP tasks. You could, for example, recreate the results from um, Ziff's law that we discussed earlier by simply tokenizing your text this way and then counting the frequency of the words and so on. Of course, the con of this approach is that it does remove important or potentially important punctuation and special characters, as we're going to see with this example. So in the new example that we've got here on the right, uh, we have a sentence that says it doesn't cost $4.45 or so. You can see that there's all sorts of special characters littered throughout here. There's a dollar sign, there's a, a clitic within doesn't, this symbol here. It's called a clitic. And then there is a hyphen that shows up um, between the words or and so at the end. Well, if we were to do a simple white space split on this, we would kind of mangle the sentence a bit, right? The four and the 45, which are actually uh, related to the cost, would be split separate. And this sort of doesn't capture potentially what we want if we were interested in figuring out something about the costs of things within uh, a menu, for example. Okay, so when you're doing word tokenization, the easiest off-the-shelf tool to use for that is pen tree bank tokenization. It's very commonly used tokenization standard. It's put together by the Linguistic Data Consortium and many tools such as Python's NLTK, which we will be talking about in the tutorial section of this lecture, um, have it uh, either implemented or make it very easy for you to implement. So I've got an example there on the right hand side, but you can see here that for the example text of 
that USA poster print costs twelve dollars and forty cents. The uh, Pen Tree Bank tokenization that's built into NLTK understands that USA should be combined into a single token. Post the the poster print, despite it having a hyphen, should be put together, and twelve dollars and forty cents should also be together. So there are uh, lots of tools that implement Pen Tree Bank tokenization, which you can take advantage of. And if you'd like to um, even edit, for example, the regular expression shown there on the right-hand side to modify it for your own particular pre-processing needs, that's something that you can do as well. So both the Pen Tree Bank approach, as well as the simple white space split, are rule-based algorithms. We write out a regular expression, the regular expression parses the text, and it separates things out into tokens. There's been a lot of interest more recently in using data-driven approaches to automatically tokenize the text without writing out any rules at all. In fact, some of the uh, more powerful contemporary natural language processing approaches, such as BERT, use a data-driven approach for the tokenization. One of those data-driven approaches that I'd like to discuss here is byte pair encoding. By pair encoding is based on a method for text compression, and it creates a vocabulary of tokens by sequentially merging frequent pairs of characters together. So I think the right way to understand this is by means of an example. Uh, the example that I'll be using is coming from a textbook that was published by some faculty members out of Stanford University. I've put a link to the textbook there at the bottom of the slide in case you'd like to read more about this example on your own. Okay, so let's step through it. Let's assume that we were given a dictionary of terms and how frequently these terms occurred. Now this dictionary could, could have been produced from some empirical data that we collected by just splitting every time we saw a white space character, right? Okay, so let's assume in this dictionary, which we're showing on the left, We've captured not only what the word was that we observed, but we captured how often that word occurred. So the word low occurred five times, the word lowest occurred twice, newer occurred six times, wider three times, and new twice. Okay, and let's say that we also run through here and we say, hey, what are the total number, or let's, what's the total set of unique characters that appear in this dictionary? So for example, L appears, O appears, W appears, spacebar character appears, and so on. Well, the way that the byte pair encoding algorithm works is by trying to find pairs of these characters that frequently co-occur and then actually merging them into a new pseudo character. So the way it does that is by first kind of stepping through and counting all the unique pairs of the characters or the, you know, so for example, it could come here and say, hey, how often did W followed by space occur? And given this dictionary, we'd say, well, we know W followed by space occurred five times here. We know W followed by space bar occurred twice here in the case of new. So it, it occurred a total of seven times. And we would run through each of the unique pairings that we see here as well. And eventually we'd get to this one where we would say, what about R and space? And we'd say, well, it happened six times in the word newer, and it happened three times in the words wider. And if we were to do this across Every potential pair, you know, L and O, O and W, W and E, E and S, and so on for literally every pair in here. What you'd find out is that the most common pair that existed here was actually R followed by space. So what byte pair encoding tells us to do is once we've identified what this most common pair is, we merge those two characters together and we add them to our vocabulary. So what this means is that we no longer just have a, an R character but we're going to treat this R underscore as though it's one character completely on its own. Okay, great. So then what we could do is we could repeat this same process again now. We could go through and we could count the, um, the incidence of pairs. So we could do, for example, we could count how many times does E happen with this brand new character R underscore that we generated. Um, and what we could see is just like last time, we would have E followed by R underscore happening six times in the word newer and three times in the word wider for a total of nine. And, and if we went and we did the same kind of pairwise calculations, again with L and O, O and W, W and underscore, 
we would find that, again, this one has the highest co-occurrence. So once again, we would join them. And what we would add here to the vocabulary is a brand new um, symbol, ER underscore. And we're going to treat that as though it's as though it's like one character. OK, so we, we can keep doing this over and over again, right? So I could come here and say, well, now let's count the incidents here. So W followed by underscore ER, or W followed by ER underscore happens six times. Um, you know, E and W here happens eight times. So which one are we going to combine now? Well, we're going to combine E and W, right? Because it happened more frequently than W followed by ER did and, and all the other combinations for that matter. So we combine them here and we add that to the vocabulary. So if we keep doing this over and over and over again, K times, we will eventually develop a set of tokens that you can see here. We get R underscore ER, then we get EW. We, we did these three together. If we keep running this forward, we'll then get new, low, low, newer, and low. And the way that this vocabulary that we learn is used to tokenize new sentences is by actually following the merger, the merging procedure that's implied by this set of, of new uh, vocabulary entries we learned. So for example, let's assume we had the sentence on the bottom, new, newer, low, lower, lowest. Well, the first thing that we would do if we wanted to write by pair encoding is we'd obviously break it into a set of characters. And then the next thing that we would do is we'd say, okay, let's merge R with the spacebar character okay, into R underscore. So if I do that, you can see in this example, I'm just merging the R character with the space bar into uh, a single entry. Okay, then the next step says, now find anywhere where you have an E followed by an R underscore and merge those into ER underscore. And I can do that and I get uh, an additional edit. I can then follow the third step, which says merge all the EWs, uh, E followed by W into EW, and this transformation occurs. And I can follow this all the way to the end. And what you'll see is I automatically tokenize the text, albeit this particular tokenization is not very great, but I found a way to kind of automatically tokenize the text without any kind of formal rules that I had to write out and any kind of special knowledge about the way that text ought to be broken up just using the statistical properties of the language. I'm bringing this byte pair encoding algorithm to your attention and we're going into it in detail because some of the contemporary approaches for natural language processing leverage methods like byte pair encoding. Word piece, for example, is leveraged by the BERT algorithm, except that uh, instead of the hyphens or the underscores, I'm sorry, appearing at the end of the sentence, they appear at the beginning of the sentence when they're, when they're doing the counts in the dictionary. The advantage of approaches like byte pair encoding is that ostensibly they could learn things like the fact that New York, for example, is a single word, or that don't should be considered one word and shouldn't be broken. The disadvantage, of course, is that this approach is data-driven, so it could fail if your training data is not sufficiently like your test set.